You are surrounded by warm light. The light is strange, but it seems familiar. Suddenly, a familiar voice tells you, nice to see you, but it's not your time yet. As you turn around, you see that your whole family has gathered. But in your head, there's a roaring that doesn't let you focus. Otherworldly, like a dying animal. The roar keeps getting louder, but you understand that the roar is yours. Suddenly, you open your eyes and see doctors looking at you. You have just awakened from the dead. As we already know, every culture and religion has its own flood myth. It appears so frequently that many scholars no longer consider it just a myth. Some accept it as a scientific fact, supported by a significant amount of evidence. However, similar to the flood myth, every religion also has myths about the afterlife. In 1943, a young army recruit named George G. Ritchie was left unattended for more than 24 hours. He was taken to the hospital with severe pneumonia, and since no one attended to him, he died at the age of 21. The young medics responsible for him were shocked, more concerned about their reputation than the death of the young man. One of them covered George's body and after determining the time of death, instructed to prepare him for the morgue. After nine minutes, one of them, noticing a movement in George's chest corner, thought it was impossible as they had already checked all signs of life, which he did not have. Upon re-examining him, he was convinced that he was dead. However, something didn't give peace to the young doctor. He administered adrenaline. George suddenly sat up with a jolt, turned and stood on his feet. He was dizzy and disoriented, but fully recovered from pneumonia. The only thing that mattered to him was to return to Virginia and complete his army medic training. As George traveled, he stopped in a small town to ask which way to go next. But no matter who he talked to, everyone ignored him as if he were invisible. The only thing that didn't give him peace was the loud ringing in his ears. The ringing grew louder, and as a former medic, he recognized the sound. It was the sound of a heart monitoring device. George hadn't left his hospital room. He was in the same bed where he had been declared dead four days earlier. Adrenaline revived his heart, and he began to breathe. Although he had been dead for some time, he fully recovered afterward. For 20 years, he kept this experience to himself. Only in 1965 did he share his story with a psychiatrist friend, Raymond Moody, whom he had graduated from medical school with. Moody was fascinated by his friend's story and dedicated the rest of his life to exploring what happens on the other side. Moody referred to this phenomenon as near-death experience, or NDE, and coined the term in his book, Life After Life, he wrote. His writings inspired many others who were also curious to know what happens on the other side. One of them was Dr. Michael Sabum, who wrote several books on the subject. Sabum's research added an intriguing dimension to the exploration. He surveyed over a few hundred individuals who had been declared clinically dead and revived. He asked them about their resuscitation experiences, what they heard, and what they saw. He compared their responses with a control group that had been sedated but not declared dead. The patients who were only sedated provided unclear and often incorrect answers. They simply guessed what might have happened to them, as they truly didn't know. However, the patients who had genuinely died and been revived described their resuscitation experiences almost perfectly down to the smallest details. Sometimes they even provided more details than the researchers themselves knew. They recounted how people in the room felt what they were thinking, and even the smells present. It was as if they were in the room, observing how efforts were being made to bring them back to life. Sabum's research results compelled him to conduct further studies. Like Moody's work before him, Sabum's findings inspired others to conduct similar research. When there are so many consistent responses in the studies, it becomes challenging to deny the truth. Over time, numerous studies and interviews with patients have been conducted. In most cases, 92% to 97% of patients accurately describe their moments of death. Many doctors and nurses have also shared profound insights from their experiences in hospitals. Dr. Carl Green, a neurosurgeon, had a patient whose heart stopped in the middle of an operation. After finishing the surgery, he spoke with the patient he had saved. The patient described every detail of the operation from the smallest details. It is not uncommon for patients to have out-of-body experiences during surgery when they briefly die. I have no doubt that you too may have relatives who have had similar experiences. 
My mom battled breast cancer. She was given strong chemotherapy because her cancer was difficult to treat. One day, while visiting her, she mentioned to me that she had died the night before. She saw herself from above, saw the entire room, and saw her long-deceased mother and aunt and my grandparents. At first, I didn't believe her and thought it was just delusions. But later, she told me what happened exactly when she was supposedly dead. Leaving her hospital room, I asked the doctor what had happened the night before. He confirmed that her heart had briefly stopped due to the intensity of the chemotherapy and reviving her was challenging. However, they managed to bring her back. The doctor then informed me that she was struggling heavily against cancer and that it might be her last night. It was. My mum passed away after a week. But all the while, I feel that she was with me. Some people have reported not just observing their body from above, but also traveling wherever they wish. As one patient claimed, he knew he had died and left the hospital to take a walk. But then something quickly pulled him back and he was alive again. Not only do our souls bear weight, but they linger to ensure that our bodies experience death. Yet we don't just stay in one place, we wander. And while we wander, we are not alone. Almost all NDE experiences follow the same pattern. It starts with a feeling of peace, followed by a dazzling light through which a tunnel is traversed and then the soul leaves the body. In 1971, British Admiral Sir Francis Bort nearly drowned. After being revived, he described the state as perfect tranquility. He felt no pain or bodily sensations, practically feeling nothing, but his mind was highly active. His life passed before his eyes in reverse order, a common experience when your life unfolds like a film, and after it ends, you truly look at yourself for the first time, seeing who you were in life. Then you move forward. People often claim that something awaits them on the other side of their NDE. Dr. Mary Neal drowned while kayaking in Chile. Technically, she was dead for 30 minutes. She spent so much time underwater that when they pulled her out, her body had become waterlogged. And then I was released to the heavens. My spirit rose up and out of the river and I was immediately greeted by a group of people or spirits who had known me and loved me as long as I have existed. Seeing people on the other side is a common experience. Those who return often claim to have spent some time in paradise, but whether it truly is paradise is uncertain. Each religion has its depiction of paradise. A man who died and was a Christian said he was in paradise and saw Jesus Christ. Atheists claim to go into a white ether. Muslims journey to Jannah. Emily and her friends were driving in the car and suddenly an uncontrollable desire to go home overcame her. She wasn't alone, she was with friends, but after much persuasion, they agreed and started taking her home. Emily didn't reach home. In the middle of the road, their car collided with a truck. Emily's body flew out through the front window. She quickly stood up and ran to check on her friends. They were all uncontrollably crying and didn't want to communicate with her. Soon, her parents arrived from a car that had just pulled up and started running towards her. She greeted them, but her father passed by her and ran towards the body her body lying on the street. She realized she had died. Approaching her father, stumbling and holding her head close to his chest, she heard her father say, why do you behave like this? Even though his lips didn't move and there was nothing around, soon he heard an answer intended for him. That was the agreement. Then the father replied, no, no, that was not the agreement. We agreed that I would see them grow old, but not survive this experience. Emily knew that her father didn't have this conversation out loud. It happened in his subconscious. He didn't even know he had this conversation. It was his soul speaking to someone. The voice was calm and gentle. Suddenly, her world started to fade and she woke up in the hospital. There are many stories like this on the internet and you can spend hours exploring them. But not everyone experiences NDE. To have such an experience, one needs permission and not everyone goes into the light. Some go elsewhere. Howard Storm woke up in his hospital bed in 1985. He was in Paris with his wife on a romantic trip. They had driven out for a romantic journey. Howard was a very nervous person, and when his wife kept closing the hospital curtains, it bothered him. And why was she crying when it didn't concern her? Howard had been in pain for a few hours after reaching the hospital with a pierced abdomen. Doctors ordered immediate surgery. Otherwise, he wouldn't survive more than five hours. 
But the hospital couldn't help him, and now he lay in bed, pain-free, and he felt much better. Suddenly, he longed for light and fresh air. As he looked around, he saw his wife beside him. He felt her hatred radiating towards him. Why is she angry, Howard thought, but he didn't want to start anything with her now. He wanted to find a doctor and walked out the door. Going into the corridor, he realized that he wouldn't return to the same room in his life. He didn't know how he knew it, but he just knew. The corridor was dark and something covered the light. Suddenly, he saw dark silhouettes. He understood that they had come for him. They came to drag him back to hell. Soon, he heard a voice telling him, we're almost there. Howard didn't believe in gods, but those beings started tearing him apart. But were you experiencing pain while this was happening? Yeah, and it was horrible. It was, I mean, it was horrible. Being, literally being torn apart. Even though he didn't believe in gods, he begged for help, and he received it. Something pulled him from darkness into the light. His life was shown to him. It was horrific. Scientists still don't know how our brains work. What sources of energy make up our thoughts and reactions? Scientists are still trying to figure out whether cell activity creates the mind or the mind creates cell activity. And what is our mind? Is our mind our soul? Are the brain and mind one thing or separate? When we die, does our consciousness die with us, leaving only the soul? No one knows for sure. In May 2023, studies from the National Academy of Science were published. Dr. Timo Borgigen and her team studied consciousness. They wanted to find out what the minimum process was needed to create our consciousness in our brains. The studies were conducted with four patients in a coma, close to the threshold of death. These patients were chosen because, although they were not completely dead, their minds were completely inactive. They all had brain injuries. With their relatives' permission, they were allowed to scan their brains when they would be disconnected from life support. The red scale represents brain activity. The blue one shows no activity. That means a person connected to life support has very low brain activity, leaving only autonomic motor functions necessary for breathing, heart rate, and hormone regulation. In other words, everything the body does on its own. Consciousness is higher, roughly between 50 HZ and 200 HZ. When patients were taken off life support, something interesting happened that even baffled scientists. Suddenly, brain indicators were activated. Let's not forget that now the body is dying, the lungs and heart no longer work, but the brain suddenly becomes active. Something happens to the patient 10 minutes before brain death. So we can conclude that random neurons are still firing because oxygen is lacking and the body is dying. But suddenly this happens. Suddenly the patient's brain activity rises to that of a conscious person, the entire spectrum full of activity. Let's not forget that the patient is medically dead for about 10 to 13 minutes, but his mind is fully alive and active. Skeptics may say that these are just desperate neurons trying to survive, but that's not true. All activity occurs in a part of the brain called the somatosensory cortex and dorsal prefrontal cortex. The somatosensory part is responsible for all sensory aspects like smell, touch, taste, even your body's position. This part of the brain activates when engaging in physical activity like running, where your mind needs position and balance. It also activates when making very precise movements, playing the piano or writing by hand. This patient is dead, but his mind thinks he is engaging in physical activity. The dorsal prefrontal cortex is responsible for problem solving and logical thinking. This part of the brain is also used for language and communication. The brain of this patient activates into some kind of dilemma solving and thinking and physical activity. Brain activity was not random. It was specific and organized. No one can say for sure. Perhaps when we die, our souls go somewhere. Maybe one day we will know. Thank you for watching and hope you enjoyed our deep dive into the dark.